So we have a great and intimate uh, crowd. Um, just before I start, an apology. Um, I did take the red eye here. So um, if I think I'm just at the right equilibrium right now between being caffeinated and being exhausted. But if I do start speaking too fast, too slow, or twitching, or anything like that, do let, do let me know. So just a few things about me. First of all, I'm a very big board game geek, which is my hobby. Um, but the second thing is that I'm pretty much torn, and I think this is something that's very characteristic of me, between being a product guy and being a developer. Um, just out of curiosity, um, are you guys developers, uh, product managers? Everyone is a developer, manager? Scrum Master. Scrum Master. I'm a transformation code. Cool. You're a developer? Scrum Master as well? Perfect. And this kind of leads to kind of the third point, which is, so yes, I was a developer, a product manager, um, a manager, a Scrum Master. And throughout that time, I was really fascinated by development processes by how can we actually improve the quality of the software that we're delivering, and how can we create a better process. And this has also led me to continuous feedback, which I'll talk to you about today, and kind of led me to spawn a new open source project around that that I'll talk about as well. But the more important thing is that as a developer leading Scrum teams, most of my effort went to these areas that you can see on the board now. So basically, how do I improve planning? How do I improve the um, continuous integration, continuous deployment? How do I accelerate releases? And it's my sentiment that it wasn't just me. It's kind of the entire industry where, where we're going, where we're put, putting all of our focus, is how can we do things faster? How can we deliver um, more incrementally, right? Which is very, very agile in thinking and makes a lot of sense. But it was also my sentiment while working on these processes and how to optimize them that we're missing something. And what I think we're missing and some of the work that's been done around that, not just by me, but by the many in the industry is, is what we'll discuss today. So to make it a bit more tangible, let's look at a concrete example, a story. And this is a developer called Bill, and he wants to introduce a fix, or you know what, introduce a new feature. He's upgraded the data access layer, he added a bunch of new capabilities, caching, second level caching, all sorts of things. He wants to introduce that capability. So using all of the best practices, and, and he's a very diligent developer, he develops the code, he writes the test, there is a whole kind of GitOps process to get that version rolling, actions are being sprung, CI processes, continuous deployment even. And the question that Bill is asking himself, and this is something that's been evolving over the years, is when is he done with this story that he just wrote? Now, when I got started in the software industry a while back, when we meant something was done, we basically meant that we, we've coded it, that's it, right? We, we throw it over the fence, there is some QA guy, he knows how to handle it, he'll, he'll take it from here, maybe it will bounce back with some bugs, then there'll be some uh, heated exchange of words about whether it's a bug or it's a feature, and eventually we'll resolve it and move on. But that's no longer the case today, right? So the definition of, of done is moving to the right. So today, when we're talking about done, we might say that he's already introduced tests, that he's seen them pass through CI. We might mean that he's actually deployed it into production. And that's done. But what happens after? 
So my question to you is, Bill has introduced this amazing new DAL, data access layer capability. He's very proud of it. He went through all of that process. He deployed it into production. What should he do now? Any ideas? Document. Sorry? Document. Document, perfect. What else? Monitor. Monitor. What else? Start validating this functionality. You're absolutely correct. But, and, and you know, as, as Bill or somebody who's been in, in his shoes many times, I, I kind of want to know. I just rolled out this amazing code. Does it actually work well? What's new? Did, did it affect system performance? Did, can I validate my assumptions that it actually makes life better for the end users? Is it is saving people time? Is it exhibiting errors? What's going on there? Is it even being used? But the reality of the thing, and I've worked over the past six months with over 40 different companies just researching this topic and, and understanding what, how they actually operate. What usually happens is that he takes the feature, he moves it from testing to done, and he moves on to the next feature. Because when we say done, that's basically what we mean. We kind of take it over to the threshold of production, we push that feature over the cliff, and we move on to the other task. Now, you mentioned monitoring, which is amazing. But what people usually mean when they say monitoring, and this is maybe a differentiation between monitoring and observability, is that you monitor things when you want to send the fire brigade out, when something is terribly wrong. That's when all of the monitoring probes kind of start screaming and, and, and the dashboards turn red. But what I'm talking about is a bit different from monitoring or just kind of seeing whether there, there is a problem. Because oftentimes, it's not that there is a problem, but you haven't concluded your story because you didn't learn enough about how it works. And the fact of the matter is that we have a lot of feedback when we code. You know, coding is a very interactive um, activity. You write something, you run it, you test, you validate your assumption, you move on, and you get a lot of feedback from your local runtime. Tests give you some kind of limited feedback. I'll talk a bit about why it's limited from the testing environment. But when it comes to production environment, for me, for Bill, for the developer who's actually working and developing new features, the feedback that comes streaming back is very limited. And this affects a lot of things. Me, personally, I'm, I'm, you know, some developers are very calm about it. I have a lot of um, kind of fear of production embedded into me from years of, of, of many mishaps. So despite the fact that all of my tests are green and I want to push to production feeling very calm, usually this is kind of how I feel when I click that button and merge into production because I... I honestly don't know what will happen. And then I go back home, I go to sleep, and I know that some, it could be that the, somebody will ring the bell and, and I'll need to kind of hop on a call at 3 a.m. to fix a bug, maybe not. But I don't know. And, and, and that, to me, is kind of a problem. Because if we've created a situation where developers need to worry about this, then something is not quite right with the process. There is another thing that's affecting this phenomena, and that's what I call new feature bias. And I say that as somebody who's kind of been on both ends of the spectrum. I've been a product manager, and I've experienced this as well. Like, yes, you rolled out the feature, the improvement to the data access layer, great news, you've done it ahead of time, we're very happy about it, but it's yesterday's news right now because what I'm tracking is the roadmap and I want to move ahead. So the new feature is the, is the number one most important thing that we need to worry about. 
Now, looking at this process and what that means, working with my team on accelerating releases, I found out that essentially what we were doing when we were accelerating releases without proper feedback is we're throwing features over the fence at a higher rate. So we were just throwing more features over the fence. We were doing it, and you know, when it was failing, it was failing fast, and that feedback we got. But that's all it meant. And when we talk about continuous delivery, please notice it's not continuous release. It's not just about sending it over to production. We need to ensure the feature successful delivery. We need to learn from it. And if we don't create a learning cycle, then there is a problem in the process, in the dev process that we've created. Now, I thought to myself, well, somebody must have thought about it in the past. And I looked to the, you know, this DevOps infinite sign that I, you know, has become completely overused by now. Now, do you see anything missing in this diagram? And I picked this up from the web. You can find some other, there, there are a lot of other versions of this going around. Now, take a look at this diagram and tell me what here seems a little off if that jumps to you at all. Well, I'll tell you what, what struck me. And I was looking at this and saying, OK, well, there are plenty of tools for build, for continuous integration, for deploy, for operations, whatnot. And then you look at continuous feedback, and there is one tool attached to it, and it's Salesforce for some reason, which I still haven't figured out after six months of looking at this. But what does it mean? Where are the continuous feedback tools? Why don't we have, you know, I have a CI framework. I, it's working brilliantly. I moved to, you know, there are a lot of new development there, and GitHub Actions is awesome, and there are a lot of other tools. But where are the tools that actually take the information and bring it back as feedback into the dev process? And, and the fact is that, you know, I remember that when I got started, again, many years ago on Agile, this Agile expert that I talked to, he was kind of a no-nonsense no kind of guy, which, which I really appreciated. And he, he didn't like all of the highbrow kind of quotes and, and kind of uh, um, setting you on the Agile path or whatnot. But he, he just said, you know, Agile to me is about dispelling the illusion that Waterfall creates that everything is working as planned. Because, and this often happens, is that when you go into a tunnel and you're working in a waterfall way, you don't really know how off you are until very late. So Agile really helps optimize the process. But without feedback, it doesn't optimize the result. Yes? Can you speak up a bit? Yeah, tools like Sumo Logic and those kind of tools, won't those be considered as feedback tools? I think they're monitoring tools, but at the end of it, they're giving you feedback about the system, right? So ask yourself, as a developer, how often do you use, you use Sumo Logic when you're not looking for an issue? Not a lot. All of these monitoring tools started as tools that were created for IT, for ops, started to kind of talk to developers, but you know, who has time? And I'll talk in a sec about why we're not using them. So yes, they're looking at data that's really important, but we're not using that data. So let me challenge myself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very kind of skeptical person. Um, are tests not continuous feedback? Like we, invent in, we, we invest in tests. Why are tests not enough? to give us feedback about what we're doing and improve our work? Or are they enough thoughts? Yeah, for sure, that, you know, t test. And, and I think this, this, as a skeptic, is my problem with tests, by the way, because they're kind of very prone to biases. You're kind of writing the expected behavior, and then you're seeing your code fall into the happy path. 
So they provide feedback, but only from the testing environment and in production, you know, the, no, there, there are a lot of uh, systems that are idiot proof, but not a lot that are user proof and, and users kind of surprise you all the time. They're prone to biases, so you're kind of, as I said, coding your own expectation. But more importantly, they provide feedback that's very Boolean. And what do I mean by that? It's kind of true-false, pass-fail. It doesn't tell you, well, is it getting better? Did I made an improvement? Related to what? When did it happen? These kind of questions that are more quantitative are not met or are not answered by tests. So I thought to myself, well, if only we somehow, as developers, had access to objective data about our code that could kind of close that loop for me so that me as Bill, after rolling out this feature, I, you know what, I get a Slack message and the Slack message says, hey, your code was used for the first time and here's what we saw. And it actually, you know what, nobody was using it because you missed an if statement and I just saved you three months of finding out later that you know, it, 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 it was never called in production. If only we had something like that. And then I searched more and I learned about open telemetry, which is a, one of the topics that I want to discuss. So let's take kind of an aside and, and, and talk about open telemetry. The, Anybody knows open telemetry? Kind of ran into it. So open telemetry is a new observability technology that's, I think, very significant and I think completely changes the landscape of observability today and what we can do with it. Why is it important? The first thing that makes it important is that it's open, it's open source, and it's accepted by everyone. So if before we had a lot of these different players, each with their own kind of proprietary standards, you had the Sumo logics and you had the New Relics and you had the App Dynamics and the Datadog and each of them had their own agent, that argument is over. Today, everybody is kind of aligning to open telemetry. And you know what, sometimes, and I think the spec is great, but sometimes it's not even that important if the spec is, is great. What's important is that there is alignment right now, which creates ecosystems, right? Because once the data is there in a spec that's open and accessible to everyone, and you don't need to start creating different tools for different observability solutions, then you're democratizing access to that data. Any tool can now come and kind of offer their, their own value add on top of, that va of the data stream. And this is huge. The second thing that's really important about OTEL is that it's not solving just one problem. It's not solving just tracing or just metrics or just logs. It's kind of creating a spec to solve the entire problem. But the last, and to me, the most meaningful thing as a developer, because as a developer, I don't much care for democratization of data, and you know, yeah, it would be awesome to have more tools, but what's important for me as a developer is that it's already there. And what happened was, once everybody came to this agreement that yes, OTEL is the, is the thing, and this is what we're going to align around, and the data dogs of the world, and the Grafanas of the world, and everybody kind of decided on that, then the frameworks, platform, and programming languages adopted it as well. So today, it doesn't matter. And you know, some programming languages like .NET made it a part of the core language now. So a part of the standard libraries uses open telemetry. You have, whether you're coding in Golang, Python, Node.js, it doesn't matter. There are already instrumentations that automatically instrument your code and provide a lot of data as is. And that's huge because it means that for me as a developer, I don't need to be an expert. I don't need to know much about this. I don't need to understand any of the underlying parts. It's kind of a switch. I turn it on and I have data. And I love data as a developer. And I'll give you an example. I was working on an application just as an example. Um, the link is over here. Um, 
uh, on the page uh, to the sample application. It's a Python application that I was writing. And I was kind of trying to steer away from uh, a very shallow CRUD application that does read, write, uh, get, you know, you know those types that, that don't actually show you real life examples. So I set out to create an API. Uh, I was just reading Harry Potter to my kids at the time. So an API to the Gringotts uh, vaults, if you're familiar. Um, and I was just using technologies that were available to me. So I, I used RabbitMQ, uh, Postgres, uh, created an external API to translate between uh, wizarding world money and, and, and uh, muggle money or, or whatnot. Um, and I created this service. And then I said, well, let's try to activate without going into the code and adding trace statements and doing anything like that. Let's just activate everything that's out of the box. And immediately, all of these data points started appearing. So each of these kind of purple diamond shapes is actually an automatic instrumentation that I got with no work at all. And suddenly, I had a lot of information about my code. So suddenly, as Bill, I was no longer in the dark. I could see when I rolled out my feature, there was a lot of results streaming back in. You know what? This happened, and this, you know, the, this percentile of users is experiencing improvement, and this, uh, and this new error is starting to appear more often than before. Again, notice that it's not about, or it's not just about these very deterministic yes-no answers about my code. It's never about that. It's, it's always a bit more complicated. Yes, I'm running into timeouts. Everybody's running into timeouts. Yes, I have deadlocks. Yes, they happen. But are they happening more? Are they happening less? What is the trend? What are they related to? These are the questions that I want to answer in order to improve my code. And as I mentioned, a lot of open source tools started to appear. So Jaeger, as an example, is a tool that is great that you should familiarize yourself with because what it helps you do is it takes all of that data and it creates a trace visualization. Now, um, I have to confess, I, one, of my, one of the things that I hate the most is logging. And the reason I hate logging is because it's the single most misused protocol in the world. And it's amazing that today, after all of these years, we're still writing text messages that were once stored in files to be picked up by somebody, you know, in the age where we have data mining and everything. And the reason is that, you know, I've, it's too often that I've seen people, you know, I, I go to, and I, I won't name any companies, but I'll just say these are very mature code bases that I've looked at for very high known companies or well-known companies where I looked at the code and I see, well, here's a console log here. And then a console log here too. And these is just people, developers, trying to orient themselves, trying to see what exactly happened and kind of failed debugging attempts that left the code with these derelict artifacts of what they were trying to find out. So tracing is a bit different because tracing actually shows you what led to what. And what is, for, if you look at the entire request, and in this case, it can span several microservices. And in this example here where you see the request is about um, making an, an appraise, appraising a vault, and the, the yellow uh, highlighted lines are the, the goblin worker uh, process. And we have another process that's calling it. But it's very clear to me and very easy to understand what led to what, what took the most time. And all of that information, you know, it's, it's, it's not complicated. It's kind of like without it, you're really coding blindly because you're not seeing the data. Yeah, every, anybody can push code into production, right? N not anybody, but you know, many people can push code into production. It's very easy, just pushing more and more code. But if all of the feedback you're getting is tests, then how do you know? 
How do you know that you've actually improved things? How do you know that you're actually not creating a bigger problem? And I'll tell you what does happen is developers go and they continue to push things into production and they get feedback from the test. And what they're accumulating is technical debt because the code is misaligned to what it needs to do. And they don't really know. They don't know whether you know, they should have gone multi-process or multi-thread, whether this should be batched or not, all sorts of things that are happening. And when they do know about it is when there's a problem, when the fire brigade needs to be sent out to put out the fire, when there's a call in the middle of the night because there's an issue. So tracing is one awesome thing. Then there's Prometheus and Graf Grafana, the open source version, which, which allows you to see all sorts of dashboards about their data. And, and again, you don't need to be an expert. It's kind of start a container, take a look at the data, see for yourself. So all of that has become much easier because of open telemetry. And the process of introducing open telemetry is also very simple. All you need to do is, yes, add the automatic instrumentation. In some parts, it's actually done externally. Like J the Java team made an awesome job of making it completely automatic. There's a project to do it in .NET as well. But even if you just add the instrumentation libraries and activate them, it's no big deal. And immediately, you gain a lot of data. So today, as opposed to before, we have tons of data about uh, how the code works. You know, access to humongous amounts of data, which should have kind of made this entire conversation or talk obsolete and, you know, would have meant I, you know, wasted half an hour of your time and you, you can continue on to the next talk. The only thing is if so much data exists, why are we not using it? Why do we have so much data about the application? Tracing, metrics, logs. And we're not using it in the day-to-day, -day, almost at all. And this blew my mind because, you know, before when I started on this journey, kind of as, as a developer slash product manager slash manager, I was very sure that the problem is that, is that you know, there is simply not enough information or you know, the data isn't there. But the data is there, so what, what am I missing? Why is it so easy to get the feedback when I'm coding, Maybe some, but so hard to get more objective data, even from test or production environments? Ideas? It's just noise. Noise. That's, that's great, yeah. So it's a lot of raw data, right? And who can look at, you know, hundreds and thousands, if not millions of trace lines and see what, what's important in all of that mess? I think another issue is that, well, not a lot of people have the expertise. And, you know, I, when I got started trying to make sense of, of how to use observability, I had to kind of go back to Statistics 101 and understand, okay, so what does percentile mean? Why can't you average means? What, how do you get... What does linear regression mean? How do I actually know what's the, tra all sorts of things that yes, not anybody in an organization can, can know about. And when I talk to more developers, and as I mentioned, I talked to, to quite a few, they also talked about context switching. They said, well, <laughs> it's an issue. I'm, I'm working right now in my IDE. I'm, very bent on the specific task that I'm doing. I'm not going to alt tab switch to a different tool, start kind of learning it, context switching, moving between dashboards, drilling into data, and then 
well, it's not the right thing, so I need to switch back to the code. I have a job to do. And this is related to the third problem, which is kind of dashboard fatigue. There are so many dashboards out there. And approaching them is always very reactive. Like, I'm working right now. What is my motivation to go and check a dashboard? And what makes it even more problematic is that 99% of the time I check the dashboard, there's nothing there. So wh why would I check this dashboard another time? And this exactly is where we start thinking about continuous feedback. And continuous feedback is, has been there all along. It's that arrow leading back from production and into your coding. Now, what does it look like? This is the next question that I thought to myself. So, well, I know what the error that, that goes in the other direction looks like, right? So a CI CD pipeline, you code, there are all sorts of triggers, it launches unit tests, and all sorts of other test stages, user acceptance, SOAK, performance. It deploys to production, and it reaches production at the end of that pipe. That I understand. So I thought to myself, why not inverse that process and see what we come up with. So a continuous feedback pipeline actually starts from prod. It starts from the, the right. And then we use open telemetry or other uh, technologies that are available today to collect the observability data. And then we have a bunch of processes that need to process it. Why do we need to process it? Because we're not experts, because it's a lot of raw data, because nobody wants to sift through so many traces. We want to to see the bottom line. We're developers. We don't have time to spend kind of doing statistics. So we need to look at the data. We need to understand the usage, the errors, the performance trends. We need to, all, to have all of these different stages that are doing analytics. And then the results go back into the source code and go back into the IDE, where we started. Why? Because that's where we can see the data in its context. Instead of context switching between a dashboard and our code, here is the code. It's running there. Tell me what's going on. <laughs> why should, I, why should I, I look for that code in a separate dashboard? It's right here. And that is what continuous feedback means. So, that means that finally, if we do implement that correctly, if there is a platform that allows us to do it, we can get the information back. And after making the code change, I'll be able to know, did it actually work? Did it work well? What's new? Was it used? All of these things we'll be able to tell. But there is something very misleading about this. While I'm drew a pipeline and straight lines, this is actually a loop. So the data is not just there for me linearly once, you know, I made a code change, I pushed it into prod, data started accumulating, I get back the data on my code change. The data was there all along about this code, even before I started working. So I want to modify a specific function even before I introduce any change, there's already data about it. Am I right now changing some very critical aspect of the system I should be worried about or not? I talked to um, a developer in a very well-known observability company. And this is amazing because they're an observability company. And he told me, look, my number one problem, I'm doing code reviews and I'm seeing developers optimize for the absolute wrong things. And what do I mean by that? They're looking at code, and that code is getting hit maybe once a week. And they're micro-optimizing every facet of that code to make it faster, spending hours, if not days, on that task. And then they're looking at this other piece of code, and that piece of code is the single worst bottleneck in the entire system. Any second you add there will be compounded 
to multiple seconds on multiple flows. But they have no clue. Who has a clue? The guy with the tribal knowledge who's been an expert, who knows about you know, the ins and outs of the code and so on. But why is that? It's an information problem. So, if we think about it in a nonlinear way, then even before it gets started, even before Bill got started working, he can ask myself, he can ask himself, who is actually using this code? Is it even used? Are there any issues I should know about? Am I, if I suddenly encounter this error, is this an old error that's already been happening? Did I make things work worse? What should I optimize for? And then once he checks things in, we still get a lot of information because it's not yet in production and somebody is reviewing it and he also doesn't know the history. So all of that information can be hugely valuable, not just when you get started, not just when you're contemplating how to merge this into prod, and not just after you're monitoring your change after you've already merged it. It's kind of a continual cycle. And this is my personal journey around continuous feedback. This is kind of what I started thinking about and I said, wait, <laughs> we can connect this loop. We can actually take the data that's way over there in production, and we can take the developer who's sitting, looking at code lines as if it's static and completely removed from any live instances, and we can make the connection. And if we do, then we can make an impact on how people develop. And this is why I started an open source project called Digma. And you're welcome to check it out. And what we're doing there, and we're collaborating with a lot of different you know, organizations, is trying to find out what does continuous feedback look like. And essentially what I did was create an open source project and start code, uh, coding a continuous feedback pipeline something that can ingest the data from observability, manipulate it, and inject it back. And it, this actually solves the three issues that we talked about. It solves the expertise problem because now when I'm looking at my code, I don't need to understand whether it's slow or not, whether there's a bottleneck here, what's going on with the direct. All of that information is processed to me and present it in a way that as a developer, even if I know nothing about percentiles and I know nothing about kind of um, statistics or analyzing trends or how do I know whether this is worse or, or not, it becomes something that is completely accessible to me and I can use it. And why not? Like, it's kind of like IntelliSense. Why wouldn't you want to have access to that data? The other aspect is that it's not about going to an external dashboard. This is my code over there. You can see there is a highlight that says slow endpoint above my endpoint. This is in Golang, but it's, it doesn't matter. And if I click on it, then I see the info. And that's it. I don't need to go into a dashboard. If there is information, then it's overlaid. And as a developer, I can start optimizing my work right away. And lastly, instead of going out to external dashboards looking around for trouble, I just click one more click and I see the visualization in context. And this is huge. This means that if, I wa if, if I'm looking at this suspected n plus one issue, right, that, that by analyzing the, the logs and, and, and metrics and traces we found out about. My next question is going to be, okay, it's nice that you're thinking there is a N plus one, but where is it? Sh sh show me the data. And instead of going to this other systems to start looking for, it's just integrated here. So I can click on trace and see the trace and see what is the problem that is the select n plus one. If, if you guys are not familiar, it's, it's 
kind of an anti-pattern where you're doing excessive selects because of bad modeling. And it's something that I, as a developer, really want to know about. Any questions? Which observability tools are you using today? Logging, I suspect, right? Code coverage. Code coverage. Yeah. And those are great tools. And I won't say which company, but one of the companies was the guy who asked, who told me about his developers optimizing for the wrong thing. And, and it's not to knock these tools. I think these are great. But I think there's something missing in what they're covering. Um, and, and if we have time, I'll even show you a, a kind of a short what it looks like in, in actuality. But let's talk, before I move to the continue slide, to the thank you slide, let's talk for a second about this other problem that we discussed. What about the new feature bias, right? Because that still exists. W what do we do about that? How do we actually make sure that we don't always get dragged to the next feature and the next feature so that any time spent optimizing the previous feature or making it more mature becomes kind of an unwanted activity that everybody's trying to steer away from? And there's stuff that works there too, and it's not related to any technology. And this is practices that I started implementing in my teams that really work. And they're very simple. I don't think it's, it's anything that we've invented, but it, it just makes sense. And the thing, and, and the thing is, and this is, again, the, the illusion, and, and I, I'm, I keep thinking to myself whether that infinite loop sign did more harm than good ultimately, because it keeps focusing us or, or making us think that these are very, very linear processes, that you're doing feature A, let's say the user, user registration flow in this example, you're doing the test, you're doing the um, um, documentation, all of these different processes, then you're moving on to the next feature, and then you're moving on to the next feature, and it's a very kind of a linear progression between them. This is an amazing way to visualize it, and, and Agile actually made it easier to implement by adding shorter iterations and shorter loops and not doing these, these huge epics but breaking them into stories and all of that goodness. But it doesn't account for one important thing, feedback. So if I assume that everything will be running very fluidly beginning to end, and no feedback will change this plan, then yes, I've laid out a perfect plan, but it doesn't work like that. Now what happens if I've rolled out user registration flow and feedback starts getting in? Now as a product manager, what I concerned myself with was user feedback. You know, what, is this the right feature? Do I need to make any modifications? And this is critical as well. As a developer, what I'm concentrated about is technical feedback. Is this the right architecture? Maybe I, I made a mistake. You know, I've, I've just talked to a company that made a big mistake and they're doing a, a, a huge rehaul. Is this the right way to solve the problem? Should I make changes? Do I want to leave this clunky piece of code behind and then, you know, get, pay the, 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 the price with interest every, every time I need to touch it again. But this plan doesn't account for it. So what happens? The feedback arrives anyway. We get the, the user registration flow. Developer goes to product manager and says, well, you know, I think I may need to change this and this and that. And, and product manager says, well, look at this roadmap. We, we can't go back. We're already done with that. It's yesterday's news. Maybe we can create an issue and then we'll, it will go into this black hole called the, the issue pool and sometimes we'll, we'll have some free time which is never and you'll be able to kind of dig it up and, 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 and pick it up again. So ultimately we just created a bad plan. 
right? However, if we plan for feedback, then we need to take that into account. Nothing that is not taking into account, well, if, if you don't think about it ahead of time, it will surprise you, and nobody will want to deal with it. So instead of doing that, let's look at the user registration flow and say, okay, we have a development phase, which is awesome. We're going to deploy it. Then we're going to get feedback. And during that time, we can have some of the people start on the new feature, but we're allocating time to have additional work. Why? Because there is always additional work. And if there isn't, then awesome. We've made up some time, and we can accelerate our roadmap, and we can look great. But if we don't, we don't introduce this entire train wreck just by handling feedback we received. Why do I say a train wreck? Because this previous roadmap, it doesn't just trickle down to the developer or the product manager. There's business stakeholders there as well. And because they were shown this plan, which is you know, estimations, the, the, there's a whole debate about, um, about that. But they're expecting the user group management in June. They communicated that to customers. So if we did not take feedback into account, then we, we kind of set ourselves out to lose. Not only that, we need to introduce it as a part of our ceremony. Just like we have daily meetings and we have scrum meetings and scrums of scrums and all of these other ceremonies and I'm not even up to date on the latest. We should have feedback meetings and they should be for every feature and the feedback meeting should review the feedback and the data from observability and people should say, well, we need to change this and that. But in order to do that, we need to have the data and we need to have the context. So what can you do right now about this to improve your code, to improve your process, or your work? So the first is a paradigm shift. Now, for some of you, it might be obvious, but sometimes it's not. And the paradigm shift, and by the way, the reason we, we, we called this project Digma is because of the paradigm shift is that you should own your code all the way to prod and beyond. It's not about coding and writing tests. It's about seeing it work, understanding how it works, and improving, and then moving on. Software is always being made. It's, it's continuous. It's not like, you know, sometimes, and, and there are counterexamples, but oftentimes when you look at other industries, you know, you, you build a building, so you put, the foundation, and then you, I, I know nothing about how to build buildings, so, uh, you know, bear with me as I'm improvising, but you, I guess you put some brick and mortar, if, if it's a stone building, and at a certain point, you're, you're done, and you're moving on to the next building, but software doesn't work that way, because people will start using your software differently, and you need to modify it, or you'll understand that this wall you put just here in, in the software kind of metaphor way is in the wrong position and you need to remodel it. And this happens all the time. So you need to change your, your paradigm about what does it mean to roll out a feature. And you should not say to yourself, this is now DevOps. This is now Ops. They will take it from here. Because that was the exact same mistake we made when we got started saying, I'm going to done to be done with coding and QA is going to pick up. Next, there is already a lot of data and you should turn it on. And then you should harvest this and then you should use it for continuous feedback. And the thing to internalize is that if you don't have observability today, right now, on your code that you can use, I'm not saying you're making bad code, you're making great code, but you're, you're doing it in the dark. You're doing it with your eyes closed. No data. And the last thing is really related to the process. And this is kind of related to the ceremonies and, and the planning and the road mapping. You need to factor it in. You need to implement a feedback-oriented dev process. 
and not assume that you know done is done and, and we move on to the next because dev doesn't end when you ship it ends when you deliver and delivery is only measured by people who are actually using the system and they have a say right they they they, they can have something to tell you and you need to make to, to take that into account So, Digma is an open source project for continuous feedback, but we're very early on. Uh, so if you do want to get involved, and this could be in a variety of ways, we're looking for people to just tell us what you think. We've opened, it's still in closed beta, but I've opened the beta up for these last couple of days for the duration of the conference. So if you do want to kind of uh, give us your feedback and thoughts, um, then visit Digma AI. We'd love to hear kind of what your thoughts are and see where you can uh, take it. And that's it. I can actually, I'll be happy to answer any more questions. I think there's another type of uh, new feature bias, and that's when someone finds a bug in production and they, everyone brains the newest feature on it. But if you have been doing the analysis, it, that bug was actually you know, two releases back. And no one's actually found it until you put in the newest feature. It's not in the new feature. You're right. And I think that this is where it, it's a really important point that I think some observability tools miss. You know, um, uh, when, when we got started with Digma, I had this idea, and it's kind of, I'm, as, as you may have noticed, I'm kind of a back to the future geek, but uh, it's kind of like this flux capacitator where you have on the one hand the observability, on the other end the code, and then you have the commit and release history. And you need to triangulate them to get to important things. So it's not enough to know something exists. If you triangulate it to a specific commit, to a specific release that changed it, then you can start looking at trend lines and understand, what, as you said, when it started. So I completely agree with that. He's an uh, IntelliJ idea for Java. There's a nice feature you can annotate the code. It'll show you. Who, who changed it? Uh, the commits, and it'll show you right there. Exactly. Who, who made a change? So th that's the exact feature that I want to see on my observability. So I want to see, yes, this. And, and it could be several things, right? It could be I did a bad refactoring of this query and now it locks things up and since I did that then the performance decreased. Or it could be something like the lukewarm, you know, the, the frog in lukewarm water and I would want to know, you know what, this has been steadily increasing over time and I know that this is where, where we'll be a year from now. Uh, so both of these cases are very valid. Another problem too, we deal with a lot of legacy data. There's a lot of integrity, integrity constraints in the data. It was all you know, new database. We put those constraints in, we wouldn't have the problem. But sort of old data, so and we just when we find the constraint violation. We just do a log message, but we're not doing anything with those log messages. It'd be nice for you know, they let's go off to the uh, mm -hmm. PBA team where they can say, oh, we need to fix this data here. Still struggling with that. It's true, and, and also, it's, as you said, it's very cross-functional, some of that information. Some of it is related to the D DBA team. Some of it is related to ops. Sometimes it's, it's very hard to put the line. So, for example, you know, once, long time ago, there was the server configuration team, and there was the app team, and they were separate, but that's no longer the case. And now, even as a developer, I might care that this code is causing, I don't know, the, the, the Kubernetes cluster to, uh, to behave uh, weirdly because it keeps, uh, I don't know, it, it doesn't scale well and it causes the, the elastic resources to, to, to behave a bit differently or, or has a cost implication or has an ops implication. And I've, I'm often seeing a lot of debates where you know, ops team say, well, your code isn't optimized enough, and dev team goes, I need more resources, and then, 
if you don't have the data, then it's very hard to, to resolve them. Cool. Any other questions? Great. So uh, thank you very much. And hope you to see you on, on Digma. <laughs>